last week, um, we were talking about, we started a series about engaging your purpose. Um, and so this week, we're going to continue upon that. Um, and so we talked about your primary uh, purpose is to be with God and to know him and to be in relationship with him. Um, and our secondary calling is to do for God. In other words, work alongside um, the leading of the Holy Spirit so that God can use us in our everyday life. And friends, that is so, so exciting, but sometimes challenging. Okay, let me ask you a question. Have you ever, ex- like, seen somebody with a gifting, an ability, um, a something that you know you are not capable of? All right? Amazing. I'm not the only one. I, I remember growing up, my dad, I love my dad. He's a bu- like, beautiful musician, loves music with his whole heart. As you can tell, like all my family plays music, um, except for my mom. And <laughs> it was a joke. Uh, anyways, as, <laughs> it was an ongoing joke in our family. But anyways, um, he would show us these videos on YouTube um, of like guys who could play the guitar literally with their toes. And he's like, look at what you can do if you apply yourself. (laughs) And I was like, okay, like, I'm never going to do that. Okay, Um, standards were set high. um, And like, I'm just, I'm more of a structure person. I like things ordered. I like to be able to understand what I'm doing. And so art has always been one of those areas that has been a little challenging for me. That's why the only instrument I could learn was the drums. Okay, and there's a rhythm. There's no notes. It's amazing. Um. So, growing up, Art and I were not necessarily best friends. And I remember having projects at school, and it could be as simple as, like, the teacher asking us to to draw a tree and, like, put our family's pictures on it. And I just couldn't get past the fact that I needed to draw a tree. So sometimes what I would do is I would go talk to my brother, who is often more skilled at artistic things than I am, and he would draw the tree for me. And I remember him drawing up a tree in about 10 minutes. It wasn't a perfect tree, but it was a much better tree than I would ever draw. And I remember sitting there and being like, I am so jealous of you. I'm so jealous right now. It's a very, like, silly moment. It's in a moment where it's like, it's nothing deep. I mean, it's, it's just a tree. But at the same time, there's often people in our lives that we can look at, whether it's art or whether it's something else, and we can look at them and be like, why can I not be like them? Why can't I have the faith like them? Why can't I remember God's word like they can? Why can't I prophesy like they can? Why can't I speak in tongues? Why can't I encourage others in the way that other people seem to be able to? Why can't I teach? Why am I petrified of public speaking? And friends, this morning, we're going to dive into spiritual gifts because we are to engage our purpose. And yes, our primary calling is to be with God, but our secondary calling is to do what God has called us to do. And in order to do this, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, and we need to walk in our spiritual giftings. These are giftings that are beyond ourselves, that do not rely on our own natural talent, although perhaps that that plays into some areas. They're actually a gift from God that he has deposited inside of you and intended for that to be used in the world. I love a song that we just sung in worship, and it's worthy of it all. And you know what? Sometimes we make spiritual gifts about us. And sometimes we make spiritual gifts about the church, growing the church. But at the end of the day, spiritual gifts are only about God. Spiritual gifts are only about bringing glory to God. It's only a way that we can walk in the world. And when people ask us why we are the way that we are, that we can say, it's because of what God has done in my life. It's because I know a source that is bigger and greater than me. And he's changed my life and he's given me these gifts. And it's not about me, but it's to bring him glory. And so, friends, this morning, it's a beautiful opportunity that we have. Because I believe that God is calling us as a church to engage this area of spiritual gifts. But here's the challenge. Is that spiritual gifts 
do not function in isolation. In other words, you don't have your spiritual gift so that you can be the best Christian that you can be. You have a spiritual gift because you are the body of Christ and God desires to use you as a part of the body. In other words, in connection with the body of Christ. Okay? Let me read you 1 Corinthians 12, um, 4 to 6. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same God. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all. In other words, they all come from God. There are different spiritual gifts, but the same Holy Spirit. There are different ways to serve, but there is the same God, and there is different activities, but it's the same Lord. Different and the same is the language of the Bible. It's, it's a language of interdependence. It's a language of saying we are different. You and I are different, but yet because we're a body, we're of equal value. And you see, in our world, we talk a lot about diversity. But there's a slightly different narrative that tends to unfold. The Bible speaks of different and the same, but our culture tends to speak of different and better than. And guess what, friends? Sadly, it's not just our culture. Sadly, we can sometimes find this reality to be true in the church. That sometimes we can place certain gifts above others. Sometimes what I'm doing right now, operating in the spiritual gift of teaching, can be put above other gifts like serving or helping. And I don't believe that's God's heart at all. I know that's not why he designed the church, and that's not what he says in his word. That he, he says that you and I are the same. We're different, but we are the same value in his kingdom. And you see, when we change the narrative and we um, talk about being different but better than, what we do is we break relationship. We plant seeds of division in God's church. And what was meant to be united, one body, who moves forward and who declares the gospel can so easily be broken and divided and fragmented. And friends, this is not who we are called to be. And listen, I, I know so many of you that, um, that like you love Jesus and, and like, you know what, we're not perfect, but there is a growth, there's a beautiful heart in this church to be united. And so I'm not coming at it today and, and saying, church, you're terrible, get better. What I am saying is, church, like we've got some space to grow, and if we grow, then we can see God's kingdom move forward to a greater extent. And so that is the call this morning. You see, relationships are important, and we see that all throughout Scripture. There's, there's promises, there's a calling on a person's life, and then there's also relationships. So you've got Abraham, the father of many nations. That's the promise, that's the calling. He's got Sarah. It's through this relationship that a promise is fulfilled. You've got Joshua and Caleb, a part of the 12 spies of Israel who go into the promised land and see, is this, can we take this land that God has promised to us. The, out of the 12, only Joshua and Caleb stand up. I wonder if Joshua or Caleb would have joined the other 10. I'm not so sure either Joshua or Caleb would have stood up if it was just one of them. And then we've got Joseph and Mary, who, who there's a promise of, of, you know, Jesus coming to earth, um, and in that, there's a relationship between Joseph and Mary, a support system, a, an interdependence, a way that they can be of encouragement to each other when it gets hard. And so you see, it's not just about spiritual gifts, but it's also about the connection between you and I. I need you, and you need me. Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> and so I want to read to you a passage, 1 Corinthians 13. It's often read at marriages, but wasn't originally intended for that. I mean, it's a great to have at a wedding if um, that's like 
You want that? Um, but, <laughs> but it wasn't initially written with that in mind. Um, it was actually written in the context of spiritual gifts. And so let me read it to you. You're probably familiar with it, but it's 1 Corinthians 13, starting verse 1. If I speak in tongues of man and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And so... Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Jumping down a few verses to 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have known fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And so in the context of spiritual gifts, friends, we can be incredibly gifted. But if our relationship is fragmented, what have we gained? And so if we're going to engage interdependent relationships, healthy relationships with each other, what might be some barriers to this. You see, um, in verse 11 of that passage that I just read, Paul talks about how when he was a child, he spoke like a child, he thought like a child, he reasoned like a child. And so he gave up childish ways. Friends, hear my heart. If we are going to love each other the way that God intended it's going to require something of us. And it's going to require us to grow up. And what does this mean? It means to leave behind a place of spiritual and emotional immaturity. And what does this look like? You know, I believe that this looks like leaving behind a space where we simply know God's word, but do not act with God's word in mind. I believe this calls us to a place of not just saying that we love each other, but truly acting upon how 1 Corinthians describes it. It involves us dropping envy. It involves us not boasting of our own abilities. It involves being kind and gentle and patient. It, it involves letting go of the wrongdoings that are done to us in the church. This is the call to grow with Jesus and to grow with each other. And so if we're going to engage love, we have to engage 1 Corinthians. And there's also another place um, that we need to engage, and it's being able to speak truth in love. Ephesians 4, 15 says this, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. You see, friends, we are called to walk different from the world. And sometimes we need a little help. And that's why in community, there's a place for us to speak the truth in love. And in the same breath, receive the truth in love. Because you and I, we're supposed to walk different. We are supposed to walk different than the world around us. Ephesians 5, 7 and 10 Paul is talking um, to the church in Ephesus, and there are people that are a part of the church, but not walking according to God's word. And this is what he says to them. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And so, walk as children of light, 
For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. At the end of the day, why do we need to grow up? It's because there's a real enemy, my friends. There's a real enemy that desires to see God's church destroyed. And if we allow seeds of division, if we do not grow up and engage this place of love, radical love that God calls us to, there are seeds of division that are being planted. And so the whole point is that we do not give an opportunity to the devil. The whole point is that God's church would be pure and that we would not be hindered by the weight of sin and broken relationships but that we would be able to walk in what is true. And so I want to share with you three things um, quickly that Dr. Glenn Packham um, lays out for us in terms of how we can grow in healthy relationships and three barriers um, that hinder that. The first is pride, an unhealthy view of self and of others. Okay, let me ask you something. Have you ever uh, made a joke and then instantly regretted it? (sighs) Or or perhaps you've made a joke and then um, you start laughing and then you look around and realize, wow, I'm the only one. (laughs) Maybe it's just me. But no, it's, it's, it's real. And sometimes we can think we're funny. I, I'll speak for myself. I can think I, I'm funnier than I am, you know? And although something as silly as that, you know, isn't harmful to see myself a little bit differently. But when it comes to pride, there's a serious issue when we see ourselves in an inc- through an incorrect lens. And you see, pride can manifest itself in one of two ways. The first is through arrogance. And the other is through insecurity. They're both different forms of pride, sliced differently, but they're exactly the same. Arrogance communicates that you believe that you are better than somebody else. And pride takes the position that you, and and, sorry, insecurity takes the position that you are actually calling what God said is good, not good. Both take the position of judge in the form of arrogance, it's over another human being. In the form of insecurity, it's actually placing yourself in God's position. And that's tough. Either way, it breaks relationships. The one causes us to be dismissive of others, and the other hinders us from actually being who God has called you to be in relationships. Both hinder us. The second is prejudice. It's an unholy view of those who are different than us, and we see this within our culture because there's so many different opinions and so many different um, perspectives and all hold the idea that mine is best. And so our world is fragmented, and, and we try and talk, but talking often doesn't work. And friends, when it comes to church life, how often can we have prejudice towards others who look differently than us, who think differently than us, who act differently than us? You see, sometimes um, it's justified and sometimes it's not. But in any case, I believe the bottom line is that the gift of salvation is only given through grace. It's not earned or merited by you and I. And so therefore, we have no foundation for prejudice towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a place of love, there's a place of truth, but there's no place for prejudice in God's church. And the last one is um, the false teaching of uninhibited, uninhibited freedom. This one is tough. Um, 
Because friends, as I've said before, you and I are called to walk different. And um, there is a difference between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. In Galatians 5, 16 to 17, says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Friends, the flesh is disordered passions. And their desires surrounding sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness. All these things, the walking in the flesh, have one thing in common. They go beyond God's loving boundaries for you and I. And beyond that, they paint the picture that God's Fences, God's boundaries, which are in place to protect us, are actually the limiters to our freedom. And so once again, we're called to a place of humility, trusting God's word, trusting God's character, trusting that God actually knows what's best. And so friends, we want to do something a little bit different today. Because um, when pride and prejudice and um, going beyond boundaries is a part of our life, it does a work in us, but eventually it shows up between us. In other words, what takes place in your life affects you, but it also affects us. And so I want to invite you this morning, if you would, actually you can stand with me. Because we're going to jump into worship in in just a few moments. But we want to do something a little bit different. And we want to open up this altar space right here. And I want to place two invitations before you. The first is for those of us who desire to know how God has created us. For those who desire to know the spiritual giftings that God has placed in us, perhaps desire to know the way that he desires us to use our spiritual giftings in our workplaces, families, communities, everywhere that we go. And the second invitation is actually an invitation to come and to humble ourselves before the Lord and to say, God, I want to use my entire life to serve you with my every ounce of gifting and imperfection that I have, I give it to you. So I lay down my pride. I lay down my prejudice. I lay down my perspective. And I trust you. So I'm going to pray. And then if you feel it on your heart to respond, please make use of this space. This is between you and God. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you that you desire to use your people. We thank you that you desire for healthy relationships amongst your church. And so, Father, I just pray that in this moment that you would breathe life on your church, that you would speak to us of of the giftings that you have placed inside of us and the calling that you have destined us to engage. And I just pray also for a profound place of humility, of, of recognizing, Lord, you are worthy of everything including laying down my life, my pride, my prejudice, my freedom. I lay it down before you. So would you speak to us this morning? Would you meet us at this altar? And would you pour out your spirit on your church that there would be unity and that we would see a move of God in this city? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.